Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. It is such a beautiful day once again because it's we're all here together and enjoying it as a family. And Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The steadfast love of our Lord never ceases his mercies, never come to an end. They are new every morning. And great is your faithfulness, Lord. Let us stand and sing together as we rejoice in the faithfulness of our God.
is our God, and all will say how great, how great is our God. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. God is good all the time. Amen, amen. We want to sing how great he is today, right? And how good he, God is good. So I'm so glad to be here with you. I, I pray that that is the same uh, heartbeat that you're feeling today and, and uh, just grateful to, to, to be able to come here to, to worship the Lord. I want to welcome each and every one of you and uh, especially if you are a guest of ours uh, today, uh, we're glad that you've come to worship with us. Uh, I want to invite you to be able to connect with us, or that might even include, say, you, that you've been here even two or three times, and, and you've not shared with us who you are a little bit. Help us to connect with you that we might be able to be more effective in ministering to whatever needs that you have. Uh, so I invite you to find the card in the pocket of the seat in front of you. It's called the connection card, and fill out whatever you feel comfortable sharing about yourself. You may want to make some comments or even ask questions or, or request information, but we also want to partner with you in prayer, and there's a place on the back for prayer requests. Now, I would say that today is also an exception to even the prayer request because I'll tell you about an insert that we have in just a moment in the bulletin. But if you would take the connection card to the connection center... The counter to the left as you're heading in that direction at the end of the service. We just want to give you a, just a small gift of appreciation. Um, uh, just glad that you're here. So uh, uh, we invite you to do that. If you open up your bulletin uh, with me, the first thing that you will notice is an insert there that uh, applies to today's message in uh, Mark chapter 2, we're uh, preaching a series through the gospel of Mark. We're only in the second chapter out of 16, so we got a ways to go, but a great passage today, and uh, I encourage you to use this as a learning tool. Find Mark chapter 2 in your Bible. I encourage you all to bring Bibles when you come to worship here, but if you don't, please find a blue Bible under the seats of some of those chairs there, and you can find page 708, 708, I should say Mark chapter 2, and uh, you bookmark it there, and we'll get to God's word in just a little bit. The other uh, insert that I uh, mentioned was Wednesday, the first Wednesday in every month, we have a special service, unlike any other service. Sometimes people make it the first service, and they say, what is this? But it's called Uplift. It is quite a bit uplifting in the time that we devote to prayer and to praising God. And something we call Brag on Jesus, sharing testimonies that's very encouraging. But we also provide prayer lists. And if you need an update on a prayer, previous prayer request or if you have a new prayer request, you can use this. Either drop it in the uh, boxes uh, before you leave or take it to the Connection Center, and we'll update that. So mark it on your calendar, July 7, July 7. That's a week from this Wednesday. I encourage you to, uh, uh, to come and join us in that very special uh, time. Prayer is, is vital in the gathering of God's people, and there's something special about that uh, service that uh, uh, will truly change you. Uh, last uh, Sunday, we gave out these invitations. This uh, Tomorrow is a very special event, or starting a special event in the life of our church. Uh, our outreach to children and, and Bible teaching for the summer is called Five Day Club. Five days are this Monday, tomorrow through July 2. They meet every uh, day for five days starting at noon. Um, if you didn't get one, there's a few more at the Connection Center. I hope most of you don't have one of these because you already gave it away. You gave it as an invitation to a family that has children or, or whatnot. And uh, 
And please be in prayer. We're going to pray for that in just a moment. But, but uh, this is vitally important, and we just need God to show up in a big way. So uh, I encourage you to do that. So we've talked about Five Day Club and uh, looking at some of the uh, things ahead, uplift I've already mentioned. I'll speak more at the end of the service, so I'll save your time right now. But a very special guest of ours is coming on July 11. His name is Michael Facciani. If you arrived early enough, he's the voice that's singing over the speakers. And uh, just to get you uh, familiar with his uh, voice, uh, he'll sing a, a little bit in the service uh, that evening dedicated to his uh, presentation. And then on the next day, he holds about an hour workshop on Monday on teaching us how to write our story for our legacy. I want to remind you that uh, that we're planning a trip to the Tabernacle down in Tarpon Springs. Uh, If you want to know more about that great museum, uh, ask uh, Elaine and uh, and there's a sign up at the Connection Center to see how many people are interested in uh, going. Uh, One last thing that I'll I'll mention real quick is uh, some time ago earlier in the year, I asked you all to donate to CMA and its missionary uh, efforts all around the globe. For years and years and years that I know of, our goal has always been $5 million and never be able to, to make it. When even this year we tried something new is, hey, buy tickets to Angelotti's and uh, you get a free spaghetti dinner uh, or, you know, you're contributing to that and giving to the mission. I want to announce to you today that the results of that run for the sun, S-O-N, was, was, it was announced at a big um, national rally for the first time. $5.3 million was raised. Amen. Amen. The really great news is that God did that through a COVID year. All the years, uh, we've never been able to make that goal. And yet in the year of, of the, the pandemic, we exceeded the goal. One other good news before I, I pray is to... It has been estimated through the work of the Jesus Film Project, the Open Doors Project, which is uh, uh, ministering to persecuted uh, Christians around the globe, and uh, another uh, uh, missionary called Missionary Ventures that provides uh, vehicles, primarily motorcycles, to pastors in, in faraway places to be able to minister, to which, by the way, the local river riders, my chapter, and, and Lenny and Sheila and of a number of others, uh, we were raised enough money to send a motorcycle uh, to a pastor somewhere in this world. So it is really great news. But th- amen, amen. But it's usually estimated by the results of the people who are saved by CMA's efforts is equal to one life per dollar. <clears throat> wow. So just think that when you get to heaven and you get to con- what your contributions meant, well, is that you will meet 5.3 million people that got, get saved in the next year because you've been a vital part of it. That's kingdom work. That's what we're a part, even in a small way here in a small place called Beverly Hills. So I just want you to be able to brag on Jesus, to celebrate uh, Jesus and your part that you have played when, when you give. So I just thank you for that. Thank you. And you. You've always been loyal and faithful, and I appreciate you so much. Let's go to the Lord right now. Father, we do give you all thanks, honor, and glory. That when we think that there are some things that are really up to us to accomplish, Lord, you help us to remember that uh, it's all about you. It's all about Jesus. And so help us to remember that as we go through this sermon series, that it's all about Jesus. It's not about me. And so, Lord, we celebrate the work that you have done and what you're going to do even as we lift up five-day club. 
the members, the guests, the volunteers of, of, uh, of our Kids on the Rise ministry, our Good News Club, that, that reach out to minister to children in love and in hopes of reaching their families. We thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Yes, we pray for Five Day Club, but we thank you, Lord, because we're confident that coming to you in prayer as we have been for months and months and months, that you will show up and you will show off and you will be glorified. I pray again that, that there will be children who give their lives to you, who will come to you, as Jesus said, as children. And I pray that that's what we can expect today, that even as adults, we come with the faith and the heart attitude of children, letting nothing impede us. Father, may we draw close to you in this time of worship, that what we think, what we say, we do, what is glorifying to you. And we just trust, Lord, that you will do a great and mighty work right here today. Reveal your glory. Draw us closer to you that we may worship you. I pray in the name above all names. How great is our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise team, please lead us. We make a lot of decisions every single day. Some of the decisions are small and some of the decisions are big. But life is full of many decisions. But I choose to live for him who died for me. Why? Because it's all about Jesus. Let's stand and sing together. decisions. Have you decided to follow Jesus? This next song is not just a song. Think about it as a testimony. Sing it straight to him. I have decided to follow you, Lord. Let's sing together. Jesus, I have decided. 
We know we have victory in you. We ask a blessing on Pastor as he delivers your words from your book. And he does it so eloquently. Bless him, Lord, as he delivers the message today to all of us in the sanctuary, to all of us who are listening in YouTube. May they not fall on deaf's ears. May you listen to them, absorb them, live by them, walk by them. Show Christ in your life to the others that need to see your light. We say all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. It is all about Jesus. The object of men's repentance is God's forgiveness. And that is the dual theme of the gospel. That men and women must turn from their sin in order to, uh, for God to forgive, to cleanse, to save them. And the only people who ever receive salvation and enter into God's kingdom are those who acknowledge their sinfulness and repent of it. It follows then that those who consider themselves already to be righteous uh, see no need for repentance or forgiveness, and thereby they shut themselves out from salvation in the kingdom of God. And it also follows that, that the righteousness that you may perceive to have in not needing any repentance, even as a Christian, is unpleasing to God and therefore will deny you of his blessings. Pride was the root cause of the fall. And therefore, humility must be the first Christian discipline. Augustine of Hippo once said, it was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men as angels. Pastor Josh uh, uh, Rivas from Jacksonville said that one of the keys to humility is hating my own sin more than I hate everyone else's. Our sermon series church family is uh, through the gospel of Mark. And it's called, It's All About Jesus. Now today we're in Mark chapter 2, as I said earlier, looking specifically at verses 13 to 17. Now my, 
ESV Bible uh, titles it, Jesus Calls Levi. Uh, but my message, however, is titled, Matthew Party. Now, Levi and Matthew happen to be the same person, just as Simon uh, later is called uh, uh, Peter by Jesus. So the calling of Levi or Matthew to follow Jesus is found in Matthew's gospel, as we might well ex ex expect, here in Mark, of course, and also in Luke. Now, both Mark and Luke refer to him as Levi. Matthew is the name that he gives himself in his own gospel. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to call him Matthew today, all right? But as we open up our Bibles, I want to invite you to stand with me as we read God's Word together to honor the reading of God's Word. Again, Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 17, or page 708, if you're looking at the church Bible. I'm in the ESV translation. You choose whatever you prefer. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, the, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And church, I believe that final statement by Jesus beautifully frames the passages of Scripture and becomes the central truth as to why Jesus came to earth. For in the passage where another tax collector is saved, Jesus will pronounce this truth. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let us pray. Father, we recognize today the, the problem of pride. And sometimes it is in our own pridefulness that we attribute that sin to someone else. But I pray in all humility we submit ourselves to you to be open-hearted and, and open-minded to receive your word that it might change us. For the work of the Holy Spirit is to do just that, to illuminate truth. And so, Father, I, I just ask that your presence be known, felt, perceived somehow, some way, through the scriptures. And we draw closer to you because of it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated, church. Now, if Jesus came to this world to call sinners to himself, that must surely mean us, you and me. And the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, that word all is all inclusive of everyone ever since the very first created man and woman. Now, had Jesus come to save the righteous, then his incarnation would have been pointless. Righteous people need no salvation. But even more relevant to man's situation is the fact that there are no righteous people apart from the saving work of Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. In fact, that's your first listening point if you're following along with me. Romans also teaches us that there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. For all have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. 
Now, many people today, like the scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' day, consider themselves to be righteous. And for them, Jesus offers no hope or, or help because in their hearts, they admit no need. The, the, the gospel declares that every man is sinful, separated from God, and condemned to hell by their own choice. A person will not seek to be saved until he realizes that he's lost. And this is why I led with the quote from Augustine this morning saying that it was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men as angels. Pride caused Lucifer to rebel against God and then after being expelled from heaven and becoming Satan, he led Adam and Eve to the same consequences. It was the pride of the very first man and woman that has led us to the same consequences. Pride led uh, uh, so pride is most often at the very heart. I'm going to say of our sin, of all of our sin. And when pride overcomes humility, we fall from God's grace. And that's why the Apostle Paul would exhort us to have the, the mind of Christ. Listen to his words in Philippians 2. Do nothing out of, of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Concluding this, he says, your attitude, your heart attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now in our passage today, pride is the root of the disdain the Pharisees had for not only those who were dining and gathering in Matthew's house, but especially for Jesus, for eating with them. Therefore, let me just say straight out forward, church. Christians in many churches today think more highly of themselves than they ought. Pride prevents them from seeing others as Jesus does. Pride prevents them from loving people as Jesus does. Pride prevents them from sharing the good news with those who are lost and going to hell without Jesus because uh, in their pride, they can't risk the rejection of others when they share the good news. Why? Because pride prevents them from seeing clearly that even disobeying Christ's command to share the gospel, that they are indeed rejecting Christ, which is sin. Believe me, church family, pride is of the devil, and it has no place in the hearts of those who are saved by God's grace. Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Now, although we don't know what Matthew may have said in reply to Jesus' call, it seems pretty evident from our text today that he must have been under deep conviction of sin and spiritual need. Now, like Simon Peter and Andrew and James and, and, and John, you know, being a witness of Jesus' teaching and his miracles working all around uh, Capernaum, even if it's at a distance, I believe that Matthew would have been quite acquainted with Jesus' ministry. And although he didn't seek after Jesus like the paralytic did in our previous week, Matthew seems to have been yearning, I mean hungry for the forgiveness that the religious system of Judaism told him that he would never have as a tax collector. And therefore, when the Lord called him, he immediately jumped up and followed him. In fact, Luke tells us that at that moment that Jesus called him, Matthew left everything behind, arose, 
and followed him. Did you get that? Matthew probably had a lot of everything to leave behind. I mean, that simple call by Jesus was more than enough for Matthew to, to turn his back on everything he was and everything he had. Now, perhaps at any time, if Peter and the boys ever wanted to return to go fishing again, they could. But Matthew could never go back to tax collecting again. That would never be allowed. I mean, he literally left his past behind. Sitting in that tax booth. Uh, he had some time to think and to, to weigh the realities of, of life and what Jesus had to offer him. Matthew knew the cost. The cost of the call. And he was willing to pay it. Of all the disciples, Matthew undoubtedly made the greatest sacrifice of material possessions. And yet he never mentions it in his gospel. I believe Matthew could have written the, the hymn that we just sang. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. He felt with the Apostle Paul, whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. See, when a person is truly convicted in his or her heart and, and changed, friend, they can't wait that their, their old life, they can't leave their old life fast enough. You know what I'm saying? Their old habits, their old standards, their old practices are no longer appealing to them. And they gladly long to leave it all behind. Now please understand me that Jesus is not some uh, good luck charm. Okay? He's surely not the bodyguard just to protect your life as you choose to go on living it recklessly. He is alive. He spiritually speaks to people through prayer, through the reading of God's word and calling them to follow him and live obediently to his ways because it is his ways that protect our lives. Because he's calling you to, to follow him right now. He's calling you to follow him right now. He demands a response. Your response will require you to, to turn from your ways. Um, to, it will require you to uh, trust in him. To lead in, in and through your life. The life that he always intended for you to enjoy. His call on your life will require uh, you to make some adjustments, to develop some new disciplines and habits. To follow Jesus will cost you something. Still, will you follow him? Or will you pridely, pridefully reject him? See, the call is simple. It was just two words. Follow me. The call is an invitation, my friends. It's not a set of instructions. The call is not a set of rules, uh, but a relationship. Oh, there is no point, a finger pointing. It is just embracing arms. He didn't command Matthew to begin a, a life of impersonal religious rituals, but he invited him to join him on the road to walk with him, to live with him, to learn from him, to, to witness him, to follow him. To follow Jesus is a commitment of the heart, my friends, for a new, to a new lifestyle and to a new life. 
And Jesus had, I mean, excuse me, Matthew had just made a radical life-changing decision to follow Jesus. And, and like many new believers, Matthew just wanted to introduce his friends and his so, so, social circle to Jesus. And I, and I can relate to Matthew, can't you? I'm, I'm telling you, I mean, I couldn't wait to tell others uh, about my, the decision that I made. You know, I went to work right after church the very day that I surrendered my life to Jesus. And I told everybody in my office about the most wonderful decision in my life. And why would anyone who, who makes the most important decision in their life ever want to keep it a secret? I don't know. Anyway, Matthew's so overwhelmed, he, he threw a dinner banquet at, at his house to present Jesus to his friends, all of whom were social and religious outcasts. If your Bibles are still open, look at 15 with me. And a, as he reclined at table in house. Again, reclined at table is the position that one actually took at the dining table. See, because the, the, the dining table was really only a couple of inches up off the floor. So they literally reclined at the, the table. Actually, the, that the same is true about the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples, which is what we remember today in the Lord's Supper. But I'm not going to ask you to lay on the floor to receive the Lord's Supper. Is that all right? His social circle, Matthew's social circle, is comprised of society's outcasts. Many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now, the tax collectors and sinners most likely included robbers and drunkards, some prostitutes. I imagine some bikers were there, right? <laughs> Other irreligious and ungodly people, right? You know, the low life, the riffraff of community. To say the least, the tax collectors were the most hated group of people in all of Israel because, well, they not only worked for the Roman Empire, but they actually made their fortunes out of cheating their own people. The thing is, these sinners who gathered must have been intrigued with the prospect of dining with Jesus because they could all discern a real teacher of righteousness and his disciples. You ever wonder what everyone talked about at this dinner as they reclined around the table? What did, what did they talk about? Do you ever think that maybe Matthew just proposed a toast to Jesus, right? And, and in doing so, he shared his testimony and he recited the Roman road to salvation. Do you think that's possible? No, because Romans wasn't written yet, but surely you know that, that Jesus wasn't shy about preaching the gospel, was he? Because as he stated, he says, that's why I came. But let me ask you, would you ever consider throwing a Matthew party? I mean, and, and if you did, what would you talk to your guests about? You know, you're tax collectors and sinner guests. Here's where I want to camp out for the next couple of minutes, if you will, before we close the message. All throughout the scriptures, some of the greatest ministry opportunities we find are when people are eating together, sharing a meal, and it seems to me that Jesus led the way in this practice. Now, that's something I hope that you picked up on more than just satisfying your own stomach. 
You know, we could surely do a better job, church family, of ministering to our church family and to welcoming our new guests, even in our own potluck fellowships. It's more than just feeding our face. Several years ago, I preached a, a sermon series while the life groups led a study, and it was called Just Walk Across the Room. Just Walk Across the Room. It was written by Pastor Bill Hybels. And the basic premise was in how we approach people in non-threatening ways, befriend them, earn their trust, and then allow the Holy Spirit to work in those relationships to lead a lost person to faith in Christ. It's as simple as just walking across a room, extending a handshake, and being a friend. The Hybels enjoyed racing some of those beautiful, magnificent sailboats across Lake Michigan. And when he built his relationships among all those other sailors, um, uh, he didn't introduce himself as the pastor of one of the largest churches in the world. He didn't. For the most part, they didn't ask and he didn't tell. Because he wanted, Hybels wanted to get to know these people as they were and that shared that same passion of sailing that he did. He, he talked with them about what they had in common. Now, over time, he intentionally, and I want you to catch that word, in, on purpose, he built relationships with people that didn't know Jesus, and he sought the opportunities to minister to them when he could. And when they weren't sailing, guess what? They ate together, and they enjoyed conversation with each other. Hybels called it a Matthew party. In 2013, Billy Graham introduced an evangelistic outreach program for churches based upon having Matthew parties. And I still have some of the old uh, brochures that we use, and, and there are several out at the uh, uh, Connection Center. Uh, if you're interested in looking at it, there are some things that, that pertain strictly to the campaign and some other helpful uh, events about what we did then. But it was helping us to reach out to our neighbors in those non-threatening environments. And the same principle applied. Be intentional about sharing meals with people who don't know Jesus. And so in casual conversation, we find out what you have in common with them. Now, of course, if you work with them, you've already got a great start. So how well do you know your neighbors? And what if you were to invite your neighbors over to your house, say for a 4th of July barbecue, it's only in a week, right? Would you maybe even consider the idea sometime in the summer? But if you were to sit and talk with your neighbors, what would you talk about? I mean, have you ever thought about that before? I bet you if, if the first things in your conversation with them are about Jesus, they'd swear they'd never talk to you again. Nevertheless, it's the engagement that we ought to have be intentional with those in our circle of influence, wherever we spend our time. There's some of you out there who may like to play golf. Some of you like to work out at the gym. Some of you prefer to be out on the water in your spare time. And so you meet people that you have something in common with. And so then you intentionally get to know them. It's as simple as walking across the uh, room and shaking someone's hand. Now I said the greatest ministry opportunities are found when people are eating together. 
is true. There's something personal about eating with someone because as the Pharisees have pointed out to us today, you're not judgmental about the people that you choose to eat with. I mean, am I right? I mean, you're not going to eat with somebody you don't like. But that's why Jesus ate with sinners. He wasn't saying to them that because he's eating with them that he was just like them. No, because Jesus wasn't like anyone that he ever ate with. But he ate with them to show them that he loved them just as they were. Jesus chose to eat with sinners because they needed to know that repentance and forgiveness were available. And how would they ever know that if he never spent any time with them? Of course, many of y'all like to know I love to ride my motorcycle. I particularly like hanging out with bikers. I love it. For the 14 years that I've been a part of CMA, Christian Motorcyclist Association, I've visited all kinds of motorcycle clubs to sit and talk with and eat with people and share a meal with people that I had something in common with. The motorcycle. And it was here that I began to build relationships. I even had pizza in a motorcycle club last night. Everything goes well with pizza, by the way. Now, most of them now know that I'm a pastor. But believe me, that is not something that I immediately announced. And they now accept the fact that I'm a pastor once they get to know me. It's not a threat to anyone. But it's not about me anyway. I just want to know these folks. And eventually, I hope that they want to know Jesus. Uh, some of them do know Jesus. And some of them live very far from Jesus. And in that time, I have built some wonderful relationships that I enjoy and some who didn't know Jesus when I met them do now. And some, some, but some have died not knowing Jesus, which is uh, a, a scary realization of how time is short and fragile. Some have died, but now enjoy the presence of God with him in heaven because they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord. And it all started with sharing a meal with someone that I didn't know. But now I do. And I pray that God is going to open up the doors for ministry opportunities and a gospel ministry. And that's a prayer that I can always count on God answering. In verse 15, as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Look at that. For there were many who followed him. Do you ever intentionally engage in a conversation with people to learn that if they were to die that very day, would they have the absolute assurance that they are going to heaven with Jesus? You ever have that conversation? How does that conversation ever happen? How does it begin? I just want you to know I've, I've taught many of you how to ask that question and how to answer that question. And if you're willing, I would love to teach you. But it's a powerful question. If you were to die today, do you have absolute assurance that you're going to be with Jesus? What if you died today? And Jesus welcomed you into heaven, right? What if you heard Jesus said, say, welcome to heaven? Who do 
did you bring with you? Meaning, who did you tell about me? Who did you share my love with? Who did you tell what I did for them on the cross to save them from their sins? How would you respond to Jesus? Think about that, would you please? And by the way, you know, uh, let me just say, where is it? Who are you praying for? Who are you praying for the Lord to save? Who's your one? Take a look at the cross. Only 17 are praying for someone to be saved. Verse 16, and the scribes and the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, I mean, you can just hear them seething, sinners and tax collectors. He said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? The scribes and the Pharisees complained not directly to Jesus' face, but around his back to his disciples because, see, Jesus had made these outrageous claims that he was the son of God. And here he is eating and hanging out with these unclean sinners. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners because it was a sign of friendship and relationship. And here lies the scandal. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Amen. Of course, the sinners knew this. And so they responded to Jesus' love and friendship. And for there were many who followed after him. Now, isn't that what happened when we learned that Jesus loved us, that he was our friend? I mean, isn't that what happened to you like it did me? Isn't that the hope that we want to have for other people, that when they learn the same thing that, that we once did? That the Pharisees objected to Jesus keeping company with sinners. Now that word Pharisee means separated ones. They separated themselves from everything that they thought to be unholy. And they thought everyone except for them um, uh, was separated from God's love. Now some of the people... Jesus wants us to reach out to in love are those who have been hurt by priests and pastors and church folk who thought that they were better than everyone else because they went to church and were religious. If Jesus was to reach the lost, he must have some contact with them. He went to where the need was because those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He said, I came not to call the righteous, but the sinners. The fact that Jesus ate with sinners shows that he looked beyond the culture and into people's hearts. Whereas the separated ones... The Pharisees disregarded people because of their past behavior where Jesus saw the spiritual need. Jesus loves them so much that he didn't want to leave them where they were in the life this world has to offer. And just as Jesus will not seek, or excuse me, just as a person will not seek healing until he's convinced that he's sick, he won't uh, seek uh, life until he acknowledges that he's dead. Salvation then occurs in the one who is willing to accept the death sentence and also the acquittal of God. 
The, the man who doesn't recognize his condemnation to death has no hope for a new life. Jesus is the physician of the soul and it makes made sense to him to be with those who were sick with sin. When Jesus ate with sinners, he didn't say that they had to get well before they could come to him, right? But, but similar to when we go to visit our own personal uh, doctors, it's only after we come to Jesus that we get well. Now, the Pharisees weren't as righteous as they thought they were. And truthfully, neither are we. Our righteousness comes from Jesus, not from how well we think that we keep a bunch of religious rules. The Apostle Paul sums it up this way, and, and, and I'll close on uh, his word in Romans chapter 3. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. For everyone has sinned. And we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. And he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Uh, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And today as we leave, let's stand together and sing these words and help us remember throughout the week. week, everyone.